You're listening to TIP. On today's show, I sit down with Sean Castrina to talk about his insights on entrepreneurship and some practical advice for millennials who want to start a business or side hustle. Sean has founded more than 20 companies, is an investor, and wrote three books on entrepreneurship and business. He is also the host of the 10 Minute Entrepreneur Podcast, one of the top business podcasts today. Sean isn't a one hit wonder entrepreneur. He's a successful serial entrepreneur in many different types of businesses, so he brings a lot of knowledge on the subject of today's episode. If you're someone who is just starting a business or side hustle, I think it's super useful to listen to some of the triumphs and failures of people like Sean so you can apply these in your own journey. Before we get into the interview with Sean, I'm going to do a quick Q&A, just like I did in last week's episode, answer some of the most popular questions I've gotten from you guys over the last few weeks. And I also just want to remind you of the fee for the show. It is not a monetary fee, so you don't have to pay anything to listen to the show. I don't want you guys to have to pay anything for the show. What the fee is, it comes from my favorite entrepreneur, Andy Frisella. He does this on his podcast. And so what the fee is, is you just tell one person about the show for each episode that you like. So if you like this episode, it makes you laugh, teaches you something, makes you think a little bit deeper. Just tell somebody what you're listening to. Tell them that you're listening to the Millennial Investing Podcast and that you're really liking it. You don't have to share it across social media or anything like that. Just for each episode that you listen to and you enjoy, you learn something from, just share it with a friend. Really appreciate it, guys. We don't run any ads to grow the show. The show just grows organically from word of mouth, from you guys sharing it. So I really appreciate you telling other people about what you're listening to and what you're enjoying. So thank you very much. And let's get into this week's episode. You're listening to Millennial Investing by the Investors Podcast Network, where your host, Robert Leonard, interviews successful entrepreneurs, business leaders, and investors to help educate and inspire the millennial generation. Hey everyone, welcome to episode 71 of the Millennial Investing Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Robert Leonard. And with me today, I'm going to have Sean Castrina as my guest. But as I said in the intro, before we get into the interview with Sean, I'm going to do a quick Q&A, answer some of the most popular questions I've been getting from you guys over the last couple of weeks, and then we'll get into the interview with Sean. So to start off, the first question that I'm going to discuss is, do you invest your emergency fund? And I want to talk about this question because we recently had an episode here on the podcast where we talked about investing your emergency fund. And the truth is, I don't personally invest my emergency fund right now. After that episode, I've started to research it more. I'm looking into potentially investing some of it. I might use some more conservative option selling strategies to collect some premium. So I might start selling some puts and collecting the premium on that. But you can lose money that way as well. So I'm not sure if I want to do that with my emergency fund yet. Historically, I've just kept my emergency fund in a high yield savings account, kept it super liquid, not really looked at it as an investment, not really trying to make any returns on it, really just keeping that there as safety. And so as of right now, that's currently what I'm still doing. I might look into investing a piece of it, but with as much uncertainty that we have going on, both in the markets and in the economy and just in the world in general. I think I might keep that a little bit more liquid and, and safe for now, but we'll see what happens in the future. And I wanted to talk about another component of my emergency fund that I do that I think is really interesting and I think it could help you guys. So you often hear money experts, financial experts, personal finance guys talk about how you need to have three to six to 12 months of cash saved in a savings account as your emergency fund. And I do agree with that. I do that myself. But on top of that, I also pay ahead my loans as part of my emergency fund. And the reason I do this is because money is super psychological, at least for me. And I think for a lot of other people, you know, the rise of behavioral finance is becoming very popular. And so by seeing that money sitting in your savings account, it you're almost you almost want to spend it. I know when I look at the my my money in my emergency fund, I want to spend it. I see it there and I want to spend it. So what I've done is pay ahead my loans. So for example, on my mortgage. I pay ahead my mortgage two months or three months or something like that. So say your mortgage is $2,000 a month or even $1,000 a month. You pay that ahead. And now if you ever come into financial trouble, your mortgage is already paid ahead by a month or two months or three months. 
And so now you have that runway where you don't have to worry about making a mortgage payment. You don't have to come up with $1,000 or $2,000 for a month or two or three. And so that could be super helpful. I do that with any debt that I have. So my mortgage and my car loans, that's really the only debt that I have. A little bit of student loans, but I can't pay those ahead. Not all financial institutions will allow you to do it. But if they do, I always pay them ahead. So I have my car paid ahead by three months or so. And I also have my mortgage paid ahead by two or three months. And so you pay them ahead and then you just keep making the payment each month. And as you continue to make the payment each month, it just stays pay ahead by two or three months. You just continually make the payment when things are good. And that'll keep you ahead by two or three months. And then if you ever run into financial trouble, you're already paid ahead. You have that built in as well as your emergency fund set aside for you. So that's just a little tip or trick that I do with my emergency fund. And the reason I do that, again, is to get that money out of my emergency fund account. Because if I see that money there, I want to spend it. It's kind of a psychological thing. So if I pay it ahead on my my loans, I don't see that money sitting in my account. And for me, that helps a lot. It makes me think that I don't have as much money as I, I might otherwise. And so for me, that's been super helpful. So I just want to share that with you guys when we're talking about this concept of an emergency fund. I know that question about an emergency fund isn't necessarily related to the topic of today's episode, but we do talk about personal finance quite a bit here on the show. And I think an emergency fund can be related to entrepreneurship and side hustles because if you're able to have your emergency fund set up appropriately and saved, set aside, ready to go in case you need it, then you're able to take more risks and you're able to start side hustles and start businesses and become an entrepreneur. So I think by getting that personal finance base, getting that emergency fund set up and ready to go. I think that can help you with a lot of the things that we're going to talk about today. It can allow you to take more risks. So that's kind of how I think those two things are connected. I also think it's always good to talk about emergency funds and personal finance when we're in times of volatility like we are right now. A lot of people have lost their jobs because of the pandemic and things of that nature. So I think always touching on personal finance topics and strategies is is helpful. So wanted to put that in this episode today. Now, I want to talk about another question. The second question is, could you ever see yourself starting a hedge fund or property investment company? I wanted to include this today because this is related to entrepreneurship, which we're going to talk about in this episode, but also because this is a a very great question. I love this question. It's, It's something I like talking about. And the reason I like talking about it is because when I was in high school, even through college, I was studying and my goal was to work at a hedge fund. That was my goal was to graduate and then go work at a hedge fund. Unfortunately, it's very, very, very difficult to get a job at a hedge fund or an investment company doing what I wanted to do, be be an equity analyst or something along those lines. And I just went to a small state school in Massachusetts, so it was difficult to be able to get a job. And so I applied to, I believe it was 800 or 900 hedge fund jobs across the US and I, I didn't get any calls. And so I started my corporate career in the corporate finance world. And then a few months after that, I started to apply to hedge fund jobs again. And I actually made it pretty far at a value investing hedge fund down in Florida. I made it to the final round and ultimately ended up going out with a different candidate. So I was a little bit crushed then. And then I actually made it out pretty far in the interview process at Howard Marks, the Oak Tree, not really a hedge fund, but the fund out in Los Angeles, the one the super investor Howard Mark started. I made it pretty far through that interview process as well. Ultimately, didn't get chosen for that either. So I was super crushed. That was kind of the final blow for me. I said, maybe I should give up on this, this dream of, of working at a hedge fund. And so I did. And I went back to my corporate finance job. And I just told myself, hey, I'll start my own hedge fund someday. If nobody's going to hire me, I'm going to start my own. I've always been super entrepreneurial. And I've always been interested in that type of idea. So for me, I just said, I'll, I'll do it myself. I'll start a hedge fund. And the second part of the question, would you start a property investment company? Kind of see it the same way. You could do a private equity. You could do a couple different structures, if you will. But yeah, I I could see myself doing that. I'm not sure if I'm going to. There's a lot that goes into it. The more I learn about it, the more I talk to hedge fund managers and people who have started their own hedge funds or just other types of investment funds. There's a lot that goes into it. And I'm not sure if that's necessarily the lifestyle that I want to live. I think I'm looking for more time freedom than I am for creating the next massive hedge fund. So we'll see what happens in the future. I wouldn't be surprised if I did start a hedge fund or an investment company of some sorts in the future. Not necessarily on my radar right now, but it's definitely possible. And it's interesting for me to talk about that because if you had asked me that five years ago, there would be no doubt in my mind that I would start a hedge fund. 
as I get older, value simplicity and value having time more. Not sure that that's necessarily the route that I'm going to go. If you guys keep checking out the podcast, you'll hear my story as it evolves. And you know, who knows, maybe in two years, I'll be hosting this podcast and I'll be the founder of a, a massive hedge fund. Who knows? I'm not really sure where it's going to go, but we'll, we'll see. And the last question I want to answer today, short, sweet, to the point, and I was asked on Instagram, what are the best books? And so I'm just going to quickly run through three of my personal favorite books. And they're on three topics that I talk about a lot. And so my three of my favorite, they're not these aren't my only favorite. I like a lot of books. I read a lot. But three of my personal favorites are The Richest Man in Babylon, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, and The Intelligent Investor. And so these three books cover three different topics. The Richest Man in Babylon is more focused on personal finance, which is a main focus and a main topic that I like to talk about. The Millionaire Real Estate Investor is, of course, about real estate. It's another topic that I like to talk about. And then The Intelligent Investor is, of course, the Bible of value investing, if you will, by Benjamin Graham and with a foreword of Warren Buffett from the newer editions. And so that's probably my favorite stock investing book. So those three books cover the three topics that I like to talk the most about and provide guidance on cover here on the show, personal finance, real estate, and stock investing. And those three books were The Richest Man in Babylon, The Millionaire Real Estate Investor, and The Intelligent Investor. I will put a link to those three books in the show notes below. If you want to check those out, feel free to click the link. You can also get a free copy of any one of those books in the Audible edition or the audiobook edition from Audible. Just click the free audiobook link in the description below and you can check that out. All right. So that's it for the Q&A section. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope, hope that was helpful. I hope you guys like hearing a little bit more from me as the host. Typically, when I interview guests, I don't, I don't tend to add a ton of commentary myself. I tend to let the, the guests speak. So I hope you guys are enjoying hearing a little bit more from me. Hope you're enjoying the Q&A. If you have any questions that you want me to answer here on the show, be sure to reach out to me on Twitter or in- DM them to me on Instagram. My username on both is at the Robert Leonard. So my handle is the Robert Leonard. Give me a follow on Twitter and Instagram and send me a DM on Instagram or Twitter and let me know what questions you want me to answer on future episodes. And now let's bring in Sean Castrina. Welcome to the show, Sean. It's great to be on the show. Before we get into the main part of today's episode, tell the audience a bit about yourself and how you got to where you are today. I started my first company in my mid-20s because I got let go of my dream job that I thought I'd have forever. I had a college degree, one class away from a master's degree. And that kind of that paradigm got, saw a different paradigm that you don't have a job forever. You can get let go anytime you wanted. And from that point on, I started starting companies and I've been doing that for the last 25 years. When I talked to Gina Wickman, who wrote some of the most popular entrepreneurship books, Traction, Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, we talked about how he felt that entrepreneurship can't be taught. It's either something that you have or you don't. Do you agree with this or do you think entrepreneurship can be taught? I think it can be taught. <laughs> I think that you have personality types that it comes easier to. Like, give you an example, like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Bill Gates are all very three, very different type of people. Warren Buffett, very different personality. So it's kind of hard to box somebody into that. In other words, some are much more thoughtful. They're slower. I think that there's personality traits that make it easier for some people. But I think think any, any person has a good idea and takes action on it the end result can be an entrepreneur. In other words, an example of that is that some people just have like what I call like an entrepreneurial, it's almost like they have a phase. Example, the person who starts that one business 20 years ago, they've never started anything since they've held on to that one business for dear life. I would say they had like an entrepreneurial moment and they've kind of held on to it. You know, they have this three person business that does okay. Do I think they're a great entrepreneur? No. Do I even think they're maybe even an entrepreneur? No. They're like a business owner. They had an entrepreneurial moment that birthed a business and they've hung on to it for dear life. So I think like in talking to Gino, I think to be a great entrepreneur, you have your much more understanding of risk. So you're, you're more comfortable taking risk. You typically have high level energy. You can attract people really well. You typically communicate really well. I mean, you have qualities that I think makes it easier for you, but I think a quiet person can still birth a great business if they take action on a great idea. You mentioned that business that somebody holds on to for, say, 20 years, two, three, four employees. 
I think a good way of explaining that is self-employed, maybe not an entrepreneur, but self-employed. Exactly. They were, you know, an accountant. They work for a firm and they just move it over and they have their own little firm or their own little law firm, their own accounting and engineer. They just create their own little comfortable environment and that's okay. I think that's amazing. Exactly. But it's not an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is always looking for opportunities. It's like feeding a dragon. I look at opportunities all the time. I can't get enough of them. I'm always looking for something more. So I think you can have an entrepreneurial phase and it bursts of business, but then there's nothing entrepreneurial that goes forward. In other words, you don't take any more risk. You don't start any more business. You don't expand that business. You don't look for additional opportunities. You just are kind of happy with what it's birthed and you're okay with that. That's not a criticism. That's just a reality. I wanted to say that that, that is an amazing still feat because I think that's awesome. Absolutely. If you can, I mean, you think about it, if you can create something that you control, you control your income, your schedule, you've won. Employment has one objective. And I think people forget this. Employment creates money so you can live. That's it. I mean, we could make it holistic and all the rest, but at the end of the day, we go to work to make money to survive and to live and to provide. Well, by golly, if you could create your own business and provide that for yourself, and have more job security because you're at least in control of that business. You can control what you get paid because you can generate a little bit more business or adjust expenses. That's the American way. I have people that are out in my orbit all around. My accountant is like that. It's a great solopreneur business. Do you think another way to think about it is entrepreneurship would have massive innovation? I have never started a business with some great innovative idea. I'm not Elon Musk. I'm not missing any meals and my house would make you go, wow. I've started businesses that were very basic need. There was a need for what, and I saw a need and filled it and and have been rinsing, repeating that for 25 years, where you have some people that are crazy innovative, Uber, and you look at apps, you look at Grubhub, you look at Amazon, and you look at some businesses where I say to myself, Mark Zuckerberg, you deserve to be a billionaire. Elon Musk, you deserve to be, I mean, there are ideas, FedEx, when I think of what it would take to put a company like that to take a company like that to scale in the 80s, you basically have to create an airline, a delivery truck business, a logistics business. It's incredible. So there are some businesses where people have innovated and acted and, and put together something that makes my head explode. It's so complicated. You mentioned Warren Buffett before. Do you consider him an entrepreneur? Well, he started his own business. I mean, so by definition, he doesn't work for anybody but himself. He created Berkshire Hathaway and it's, he's a very entrepreneur in that he buys companies like crazy. But at the end of the day, even at its most smallest firm, Charlie Munger started Berkshire Hathaway. So that's where you'd say there was an entrepreneurial moment, but I don't know enough about Berkshire Hathaway. Buffett actually didn't start Berkshire Hathaway. No, no, exactly. It was a, um, a whatchamacallit. It was a textile, but because it had the uh, stock symbol and all that, then they kind of just ran everything through it. I think Warren Buffett is an entrepreneur, but to what level, you know, I don't know enough about what they personally do. At one point, there was definitely an entrepreneurial moment, basically made him worth about $60 billion. Yeah, he's definitely done something right. That's for sure. Absolutely. Do you think having an advanced business degree, say an MBA, help someone become a successful entrepreneur or could it actually hinder them? I don't think it helps. I don't think it hinders. Typically, somebody in the MBA, a lot of times, they typically work for big companies. I have a friend who's a professor at UVA and I asked him about, because I teach guest lecture colleges. And I was like, if you'd like, I'll do one of your entrepreneurship classes. And this is at UVA Darden Business School. It's a very famous business school. And he's like, we don't even have entrepreneurship anymore. All our students with MBAs just go go work in New York. I don't think it's required. My son is 19 and, and we chose not to send him to college yet. My daughter went to college and is finishing up a master's degree. She's a school teacher. To start a business, me personally, I don't think it's necessary. I do think it's a waste of time. When people say, well, you, you create an ecosystem, well, it's a very expensive ecosystem that if you got to pay $180,000 to get two friends that do something similar to you, you can meet somebody online, you can join a mastermind group. There's a lot of ways you can create an ecosystem within entrepreneurial space. So I don't, I personally look at it. I went to college other than psychology. There's nothing I took in college that's helped me in business. So I don't think it's necessary. You think you even need any post-secondary education? You go to college for different reasons. So I want to be careful, you know, and, and parse that. Is there a downside of getting more education, being smarter? No, there's no downside. I think it's a waste of money. 
But what I'll say about college, there's one thing it doesn't. Some people need this. Hey, maybe you can go into military. Maybe you go into Peace Corps. I would tell you 99 out of 100 people at 18 are not ready to have employees and be the leader to run a company. They may have an online business. But I'm saying, realistically, I wasn't ready at 18 through 22 to oversee employees to make critical decisions that are typically required in a business. I mean, I wasn't at that maturity level. So going to college, is there any downside of getting a little bit more mature? No. But again, the example of that is my son. My wife and I could have sent him anywhere. And we didn't think it was the to be an entrepreneur. I, I thought he needed to, let's bounce some ideas around. Let's get something out into the marketplace, which is what he's done. He and his friend, and they have a great business and it's going to do well. That's what I did with my son. So clearly, I think that's a better road than uh, creating debt. I would tell somebody, I actually think it's better to get a job. In other words, what business do you want to do? Why don't you go work for somebody for a year and get an idea if you really like it, learn the ins and outs of it a little bit, get a better understanding of the industry. I think the problem is we try to do everything so fast and we think everything's so easy. And there is a price to pay for success. And nobody wants to talk about that. You know, we get all caught up into all the easy things. But sometimes, example, I learned more working for somebody at a college that I needed. I learned how to run a staff meeting. I learned how to have high level interactions, debates. I learned how you terminate an employee. There's things I naturally saw working. So I don't think at 18, you necessarily go start a business per se. Maybe you go work for you. My son did an internship. Maybe go do, go offer to work for, I'd rather you work for three months for free than go to college. Actually, I think there's a discipline that you need to run a business. And if that's going to work every day and having a boss over you and being able to take a little bit of a tongue lashing, being able to be criticized, figure out whether how well you work with other people, do you solve problems well? I don't think there's a race to be an entrepreneur at 18, but I think there is, there's things that you could do to better prepare yourself without going to college. I would go work for free before I'd go to college. Knowing what I now know, I'd go work for free for a year underneath somebody that I really was, you know, I would respect it. Any way I could get in that organization, I'd work for free before I'd go to college. I tend to agree with that. I have an MBA, I have an advanced degree. But when I think about it, if I could go back and do it again, I don't think I would. But I would have gotten into sales. Yeah, I think I probably would have gone into sales. I would have even worked for somebody. I, would, I probably would have gone into a trade and started my own business that way. But when I'm trying to think about it, I think about the silver lining. I already did it, right? There's nothing I can do about it. So what was the silver lining? And so for me, I look back on it and I'm like, you know what? I did learn some organization skills. I learned some soft skills. I did take a professional communications class that has really helped me. It helped me. I'm an accountant by trade. So that allowed me to get a lot of good skills that I needed to be able to talk to people. So there are some soft skills and some organization and time management skills that I've been able to develop through college. But overall, I think I tend to agree. I don't think there's hard skills that I learned that I have a bookshelf behind me and I have 200 books on them. I've learned way more about business and everything investing from those books than I did in college. But the time management, being on time, getting tasks done when they needed to be done, things like that, I think there is value to that. Absolutely. In college, you have deadlines, you have assignments and things like that. The reality is just like everything you mentioned, you could have learned outside of college. You could have taken a time management class by Franklin Covey or Daytimers Group. You could have taken a, uh, whatchamacallit, a Dale Carnegie class on how to win friends and influence people. I sent my son to an improv class to learn how to make you know, spontaneous conversation, uncomfortable conversation. I got him in sales so that he could take rejection, learn how to communicate. The fact is I could sit down on a legal pad and write down, I think, everything you need to know to be a great entrepreneur skill-wise. And none of it will require you to go to college. Maybe you know, go to a junior college, maybe take an accounting class, or maybe a basic marketing class just to get a general understanding of it. You could maybe take one semester at a junior college and, and you'd have everything you need. I mean, in reality, you can take those courses online. Absolutely. For a hundred bucks. Yeah, you can take courses. The most valuable class I've ever taken, other than learning how to add and subtract and speak English and write English, was typing. Typing in ninth grade is the most valuable class. If I, if I had to do it all over again, I'd have taken more typing classes because I find myself typing more than next to speaking. We type like crazy, but we don't typing classes and something they really push at you. It's those ancillary skills that you really need sometimes. Thankfully, my generation was practically born with a, a keyboard in our hands. So we're, we're pretty good from that perspective. But yeah, for sure. I, I do type a lot and it does, does help me. So how does a new entrepreneur, say maybe your son, somebody listening to the show is going to start their own business, they're a new entrepreneur. How do they stay motivated when they're faced with all of the volatility that comes with being an entrepreneur? 
how can a new entrepreneur really channel their inner quote unquote why to grow? You got to remind yourself of your why. I always had pictures of something I was working towards in front of me, whether it was a car I wanted to buy or a house I wanted to get. I mean, I had reminders of why I wanted to do it. And then you also know, got to know all the intangibles. I know that I didn't want to work for anybody again because I didn't want to ever be let go again. I wanted to control my own schedule, my work schedule. I think it's important to write down why you want to be an entrepreneur and read it really every morning. Just kind of read it over. Know why. It's the same thing in sports. You pay a price in sports because you want to win. Well, in business, there are winners and losers. And winning is pretty good. You know, I always joke like uh, 32 owners of the NFL football team franchises. They either were an entrepreneur or they were a family member, an heir of an entrepreneur. It creates a pretty exclusive club. If you're successful at it, the Forbes 400 list, every single person on it is an entrepreneur and or the heir of an entrepreneur. If there's a doctor on it, it's because they started a pharmaceutical company. I actually researched it. In other words, everyone on it is an entrepreneur, started a business. Yeah, it's kind of funny. So there's a show, if you will, or or set of videos, a series of videos that this kid does on TikTok. And basically he lives somewhere, I think Hollywood maybe, and there's always supercars and very fancy cars. And he's always goes up to the owners and asks them, what do you do for a living? To try and learn, you know, what are all these super successful people who are driving your McLarens, your Ferraris, these types of cars, what do you do for a living? And he's probably got 50 to 100 videos. I've only heard one single person out of... And every video probably has three to five people. I've heard one person that was an employee and he was in sales. And I'd argue that's a very entrepreneurial position in a corporate career. Everybody else was an entrepreneur. In sales, basically, you create your own income. And I joke, as an entrepreneur, the number one skill you could have is sales. In other words, if I had to do it all over again, I would have gotten a sales right out of high school. I would have been selling cars, something right away, because you learn rejection. You learn how to communicate. You learn how to communicate and be motivated by getting that yes, which is important in business, You know, getting the first customer and all that. I think sales is the most important thing that if you could do something right, if you didn't know what to do, you could never go wrong with just getting into some type of sales right out of high school. And if you're even in college, I wish I would have sold cars while I was in college. Like just even if it would have been like a weekend gig, it would have been perfect. So for someone who's aspiring to be an entrepreneur or even just start their own side hustle, but they don't have a lot of money, that tends to be a lot of millennials or even beginning entrepreneurs, how can they fund their idea? How can they get started? I will tell you. So this is what I did. Number one is that partnering is the superpower of in business. It's created some of our greatest companies. But if you have a good idea, you're 20 years old and you have a really good idea. Assuming it's realistic, if you bring that to somebody and another, another adult, just a decent middle-class adult, and you pare it down to reality of what you think you get it started for, you get that number under 10,000, and you shouldn't be spending more than 10,000 to start a business. I would tell you that if you presented it to enough people, $10,000 to an adult over the age of 40, that's not a lot of money. So yeah, maybe they become an investor in your company. You've got to give them a crazy return on their money. They put up 10,000 and you agree to pay them back. After two years, you agree to pay them back four times. Maybe you pay them back 10,000 a year for four straight years. You got to make it worth somebody investing in you. And I always tell people, oh, that's so much money. Yeah, but zero times zero is zero. One of my biggest companies that I started, you know, and I have now, it's worth millions. I borrowed 10000 to start it. I ended up paying the guy 70000 by the end of the year just to buy him out, just because I knew it was going to do great. And I knew I needed to bring on a partner that was actually in the business. Did he get a great return on his money? Absolutely. I paid him seven times what he put in. But I, without it, I would have never started the business. So I think sometimes that we... If you have a good idea that you have really flushed out with a business plan and you have the qualities that somebody looks at you and you've, they respect you, at the end of the day, startup, they invest in you. So if you're halfway sharp, you present a good idea. I'm just telling you, if you pair that idea back to reality, you can get an investor. If I ever had money, I always had people partner with me in business and they always put up the money. But it was never a crazy amount of money. It was typically $10,000. And I did 50 50s. And you know what? Through my 20s, but then I get into my 30s and I don't have to do that. I had to buy a few people out at maybe more than I wanted to. But my point is, is that a good idea in the hands of somebody with some ambition, you can find a partner. If you look at everybody in your world that has a little above average income, and if they don't, let's say that they don't, they don't have anything. What you need to do is, is that you need to maybe interview people that can help the company and you try to get a partnership group. 
to come in with you on the company and, and you have three people under the age of 25 and each put in $3,000. You get a credit, almost anybody can get a credit card these days. So you got to get creative. I mean, I took an education loan to start one of my companies. I mean, it was like, if you take a class, you could loan you up to $10,000 and I've done it a million different ways. I've used credit cards. I have used partnerships. I think that you got to start a micro business first and that start it at the small scale, get some proof of traction, then take that to an investor just so they know they got something. In the first 30 days, we attracted this many people that have interest in this. We beta tested it. We did a landing page, whatever the case may be. I can't explain it, but good ideas always find money if it's in the hands of the right person. But you look at all these businesses we have around, they all got investors. If you really think about, it, look at everything around you had an investor, the light, this cable company, all these are businesses. Everywhere we look around, there's a business. As far as I can see, from the humidifier to the carpet company, they all figured out how to get off the ground. Let's talk about that. Gaining traction, getting off the ground. That's probably the hardest part once somebody starts a business. So walk us through the most important part of a marketing plan and how we can attract new customers. The most important thing is you need to find out who your target customer is. You got to be like an FBI profile. So let me kind of take you through really quick how I would do it. Let's say you have a product. Do you sell Dixie cups? It really doesn't matter what, but let's just say you sell a cup. I'm going to take something very generic. What about your cup? If you're going to make a cup, is going to make it why anybody would be interested in this cup. I mean, it's a very boring thing. It's just a cup. Well, maybe you make it so that it doesn't ever get hot. Okay. So you can never burn your hand on it. Let's say it's got this incredible grip on it. Let's say, you know, you can put all your favorite college teams on it. The point is, is that you have to make the product unique. That's where I'm trying to get at. You just can't be average. There's got to be something about what you're selling that's different than your competition that customers will say, I want that. So the first thing is don't bring something pathetic to the marketplace. You got to bring something that stands out, solves a problem, meets a need, is unique that nobody else is doing or it's unique. And then you got to find out who's most likely to buy it. That's your target customer. Then you got to find a message and or an ad that appeals to them that gets their attention. And that's how you beta test it. You beta test your social media ads or it can be traditional media, it can be direct mail, but you beta test it to make sure that you have a product and a message that resonates and you don't bring something to the marketplace until you've tested that. I think that's the biggest problem people make is they got this, they think the business will work, but they never test it. And then they go full flight with it with no beta testing. And then they get upset because it, nobody was interested in it. I thought it was a great idea. So let's zoom out from a marketing plan for a minute and talk about a broader plan. And that's a business plan. What makes for the world's greatest business plan? What makes it work? Well, what makes it work is it's simple because I looked at all the business plan books when my son was starting his company. You know, I was wanted him to do some type of business plan. I was going to take him through it without him kind of knowing that he was going through a business plan. But I do think people need some type of plan. And I always say, if I gave you a free vacation right now, I said, hey, you're $5,000 free vacation. You probably wouldn't get in your car and leave somewhere. You'd probably wake up the next day and go, okay, do I want a summer vacation, a winter vacation, right? Do I want to go to another country? You do a little bit of planning. Am I going to fly there, drive there, take a Winnebago or an RV? I say, just spend that much time on your business plan. Find out why this idea, what makes you think this idea is going to work? I'm just going to give you some simple questions. Like just a generic, we're at dinner. You have this business idea. Pitch it to me. Well, I think this is going to work because of such and such. Okay, that's fine. Now, vet that a little bit. Is there any competition in that space? Who else is offering what you're offering? What about your product is different? How are you going to sell it? Is it affiliate? Are you going to do retail? Are you going to do online? How are you going to sell it? What's going to be your pricing? What are your costs? Who do you need to get the team on the field to offer what you're offering? You can see where it just leads down this rabbit trail. And you can see, I always, when people say, I don't need a business plan, I just go through those 10 questions I just did and they drop their head. Really, you need the answer to all those questions. Do you need licensing? Okay, where are you going to put your business? Do you even need a location for it? Does your business need insurances? And even if it's something like Arizona Omissions Insurance on copyrights or whatever the case may be, do you have patents, trademarks, copyrights that are important? Again, I can keep going all the way down the line. How are you going to do payroll? Even if it's just yourself, how are you going to do your taxes? Are you going to be an LLC, an S Corp? My point is, is that just going through that is that there's a variety of things that to set up a business and to go into it. A business plan gives you confidence that it's going to work. You do a business plan so that you can kind of look at this business from a 10,000 feet and then kind of zoom down on it 
Example, if you go into a business and you're like, oh my gosh, we got a thousand competitors and we're all offering the same thing. I don't think I'd go into a business with a great deal of confidence. Other if I'm going into a business and I really feel like I have something unique or I feel like I have a pricing advantage, or let's say I do some test marketing and I really find like my message is resonating. I found a way to communicate this and attract customers. Now you got something. And that's what your business plan does. It flushes all that stuff, flushes all that stuff out. How long should somebody spend on a business plan? Listen, you can do a business plan in a weekend. It should never take more than you know, 30 days, but I'm going to zip through how easy a business plan is, just so that you get an idea. I always say, why do you want to be a, a business owner in the first place? Because I want to know your why. Because if that doesn't motivate you, then you're going to never do well. But why do you believe this business will succeed? What resources do you lack and you need to launch and grow this company? What are you selling and why? Who's your competition? Why will your customers buy from you over your competition? What will your cost be to produce what you're selling? What are your profit margins? Describe your target customer. Choose a business name. What will I need to get this company off the ground? The cost, the to-do list. These are simple things, but if you don't do these, you're, there's going to be a mistake because every one of these are important. What's your company name? Can you get the domain for it? That's a huge thing. I've had people present to me, pitch me a business, and I go, great name. And I go on GoDaddy right in front of them, and I can't get the name. So your name, you got to be able to get the domain for it. And then are you going to have a tagline? You know, in other words, it, what's your branding position going to be? In other words, you're, you're selling your business. What is going to be your one thing that's maybe you're going to create a logo around that? I can keep going down and down. I tell people, just take a weekend. Just take two days and your business will be better off because of it. And statistically, businesses that have a business plan statistically do better. And I think it's nothing more than the preparation. It shows a little bit of discipline. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a 30, 100 page document that you would do for college, like a college research paper for your business plan. I've done my business plans on like three pages of legal pad. I typically take a legal pad that never gets more than 10 pages in. It's never anything. It, listen, I've done them in one page, front and back of it. It just depends, but you got to do something. Like if you just think about it, just common sense. Don't you think you should know who your two biggest competitors are? Don't you think you should know what they're pricing it? Like what their prices are? I mean, I think that'd be something to know. Don't you think it'd be smart to know who's most likely to buy your product or service? Like how can you run an ad effectively if you don't know your target? How you market somebody over 60 is different than how you market somebody between 30 and 50. And how you market a millennial is completely different. So my point is, until you know the typical person that's going to want what it is you're selling, you're never going to have effective advertising. I've only gone very little, but I only asked 25 questions in my book and that I drilled down on a little bit on them, but it doesn't have to be exhaustive. It's got to have a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of a plan there. In your most recent book, you wrote that there are five golden rules for a successful startup. Walk us through those five golden rules and explain to us why each of them are important. The key thing in regarding startups, and at halftime, I don't know what, I get, a, get all excited about an idea. The most important thing when you're getting a startup is I think you got to vet your idea. I think the one thing that most startup founders do, they get the idea and they swear it's good. They don't, they don't vet it. They don't expose it to anybody. And it's just, a, you got to vet your idea. You got to put it up against some criticism. Next is you got to know why people are going to buy from you. You got to have a unique selling proposition. You got to have something that makes you different. And then you got to market like crazy. The biggest problem startups, they don't put enough money into marketing. The first thing that gets cut in a startup budget is advertising. You got to put money in advertising. Next is staffing. Our tendency is to staff a business. We go get a family member or somebody and they're cheap. We get them because they're on the cheap and they don't move the needle in your business. They just don't move the needle. And then sales. Sales is the most critical thing. If you can't sell your product, you'll be out of business. If you're not a good salesperson, you better, bring, you better partner with somebody who really understands sales. There are just five really quick things. But at the end of the day, business is so simple if you really think about it. You have to attract customers and sell them. Forget everything else I said. If I want to don't, just bring it down to the most basic, you have something that somebody wants. You have to attract them and sell them. If you accomplish that, you will have a successful business. If you fail at that, you will be out of business. You look at Blockbuster Video, look at Sears, look at JCPenney. What happened? They stopped attracting customers to buy their product. They could no longer pay their expenses and they closed their doors. That's what kills every great business. And it kills every great startup that thinks they're going to be a good startup. If you attract customers, 
and they're buying from you and you're selling it at a price that where you can, where there's a nice margin, you're going to be in business forever. But you stop any of those three things and you're out of business. If you stop attracting, stop selling, or you can't sell it for a price to meet, you know, a profitable margin, you keep lowering your prices, keep trying to be cheap. You do any of those three things, you're out of business. I mean, ro- business is not rocket science. You also wrote in that book about the seven biggest mistakes that startup founders make. Walk us through those seven mistakes and how the listeners of the show can avoid them. I'm going to narrow it down to like the three, so I'll make it really easy for them. Because these are the super, super, super three. And I kind of went over them a little bit, but the biggest problem startup founders make, and I go back to it, and I said it before, is please, when your, your idea, don't just assume it's a good idea. Bounce it off an older businessman or somebody or, or somebody within the industry. Vet that idea. The biggest problem startup people make is they take this baby, they drop it into the marketplace, and it's cotton picking incinerated. The marketplace doesn't care. It only rewards good ideas where there's a need, where it solves a problem. You bring a bad idea to the marketplace, it's going to get hammered. Second biggest problem founders make and I, is they have no idea how they're going to attract customers. They think they do but it's not a test. Again, if you can't attract customers, if you haven't figured out how you're going to attract customers, how you're going to market, if you can't do the loop of of attracting and selling customers, you're done. Obviously, I think the third thing that I've seen that startup founders struggle with, the biggest thing is that they don't surround themselves with enough talent. In the critical positions that you need in a company, everybody, there's always something you need. You do it cheaply, and I, I would encourage you to partner with somebody who's great at it. You got to have somebody who's great at sales. If you have an internet business, you got to have somebody who understands that space. You go into a business and there's just not enough talent around you to make it into a great company, to scale it. And I find they're, the, they're really the three biggest mistakes that startups make and why they fail so quickly. Untested idea, have no idea how they're going to market it. They don't know how they're going to attract customers. And they just don't attract enough talent on their team to scale the business and to take it somewhere. What has been the most influential piece of advice that you've ever received? It could be about business, be about entrepreneurship, or even just life in general. What piece of advice has had the biggest impact on you? A couple of different things. I mean, I remember just three things that stand out and you know, advice I got working with people. Number one is I was being extremely hard on somebody that I thought should be fired. And a guy pulled me aside and he goes, remember, it's a human being. Like I was just going to tear this person apart. And he just kind of looked at me and said, remember, it's a human being. And I didn't even think about that. Like, you know, you're getting ready to just blister somebody. You don't need to do that. So I I thought that was really good advice. Another time I was in a staff meeting and, you know, I'm a pretty energetic person. I'm throwing out all these ideas. And at the end of the meeting, when everybody was gone, the CEO says to me, he goes, plant an idea like a seed, not like a bullet. He goes, you want to plant it so quietly sometimes that the people in the room will actually think it's their idea three months from now. I love that, you know, the idea of their and then the final one, I remember going into a big time meeting with uh again with the CEO in my first company. It was great working for him. And I was like, it was a really important meeting and I was an intern. I was kind of like, so what's gonna happen? He goes, Oh, I know it's gonna happen. I go, well, how do you know? We haven't had the meeting yet. He goes, Sean, I don't go into any meeting that I haven't already determined the outcome of the meeting. He goes, Sean, I've had five meetings to make sure this meeting goes the way I want it to go. And sure enough, we went in there and everything went like perfectly. And he, and he told me, he said, it's the meetings before the meetings that make the meeting good. There are just three things that over the years I've had the opportunity to learn and plan ideas like seeds. Remember when you're getting ready to eviscerate somebody, they are a human being. And uh, it's the meeting before the meeting that really makes that meeting go well. And I've learned that. That is all three of those are quite helpful. Sean, thanks so much for joining me today. I know this conversation for me as an entrepreneur has taught me a lot. I'm just at the beginning stages of becoming an entrepreneur and it taught me a lot. I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to the show or who are just interested in entrepreneurship. I know they're going to get a lot of value out of it too. So thank you so much for joining me. Where can everyone listening go to learn more about you and just all the different things you got going on? All right, I'm going to give you some free things because if you really make money, you should be able to give some things that are away for free. All right, two books, and they'll, they'll really help you. I, I kept talking about a business plan book. Well, there's a way to get that book for free. I don't give that out a lot, but there is, we have a download that you can get it for free. The world's greatest business plan.com forward slash free book. You can get that business plan book. And what's great about that book is I write a chapter in it on how to be a great entrepreneur. It's 10 qualities that you need to really work on. And I, I put that in the book because I'm like, you know what? Even if your business plan is great, 
I go back to you. If you're lazy and you don't take action, it doesn't matter how good your idea is. It doesn't matter how good your business plan is. So I would really encourage you to get the world's greatest business plan. Again, .com, free, you know, free book and it's yours. And then if you're, you're not quite there yet or you're further, maybe you, know, you're, you want something different, but you're not working on a business plan. If you go to seancastrina.com, The Eight Unbreakable Rules, the book that we talked about, that's on there for free as well. So if you need a business plan, go to World's Greatest Business Plan. If you need a free book on Eight Unbreakable Rules, you can go to seancastrina.com. And I have the 10 Minute Entrepreneur Podcast. It's been a top 10 business podcast. If you really like business stuff and you like it really fast, because I have the attention span of a flea, you know, you can always listen to the 10 Minute Entrepreneur Podcast. I'll be sure to put links to all three of those things in the show notes below. Check it out in your favorite podcast player. Sean, thanks so much for joining me. Man, I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, guys. That's all I had for this week's episode of Millennial Investing. I'll see you again next week. Thank you for listening to TIP. To access our show notes, courses, or forums, go to theinvestorspodcast.com. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Before making any decisions, consult a professional. This show is copyrighted by the Investors Podcast Network. Written permissions must be granted before syndication or rebroadcasting. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on our next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts about this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.